Thank you for attending the third of the academic year and the first presentation of this semester's Psychology Department Speaker Series. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the chair of the department. I would say happy to see all your faces, but for whatever reading, the, the reason the lighting is dark back there. So, you know, other than the first row, and maybe the second row, um, I have no idea. Maybe this is all that's here. But um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Dr. Susan Riviza. She is an associate professor of psychology at Michigan State University. Um, her PhD is from Berkeley. She has a, a, a master's actually in communications from uh, Purdue. And her undergraduate degree is from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Please welcome today's speaker. Well, I'm really happy to be here. And thanks, Frank, for inviting me. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, technology use um, and being able to learn effectively in the modern age. Oh, I forget that I, I have technology in my hand. I don't need to do this. But... Okay, so I am going to focus on answering two questions um, from based on my research. So the first is, should students bring a laptop to class? And the second is, how vulnerable are people to fake news on social media? So the first um, is really going to focus on classroom studies um, where people bring laptops to class. And we'll look at how that relates to performance on the exams. Um, and the second is an experiment that we did looking at getting news from Twitter versus a more neutral context. Um, so I'll start out. Um, and so throughout the talk, uh, when I, my first paper on this topic came out, it went, what do you call it, viral on Reddit or something, trending on Reddit. And so people made these comments, which some were pretty funny, so I peppered them throughout the talk. Um, so we know that there's the temptation to use technology for off-task purposes is very high. So this person says, Instead of learning about biology, I learned how to become a pro at Floppy Bird, so that's something. Um, so people sometimes are playing games um, during class time. Um, and the question is, you know, is this detrimental to learning? And by the way, if anyone has questions throughout my talk, uh, please, you know, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm happy to answer questions as I go along. If you're in the back, you may need to like really wave because it is dark back there. <laughs> um, OK, so Michigan State, for example, um, has a computer policy where students are required to bring a laptop computer. So note that it's not a desktop computer. It's a laptop computer because it's so portable. Um, so not only should you have the services of a computer, it should be a portable computer with internet capability. So um, why would Michigan State want this? Um, because some course sections may be taught with the expectation that students use laptop computers in class. So there's an implication here that students should bring their laptops to class. Why would that be? Uh, because So that a laptop may provide expanded instructional opportunities uh, for students. So in some classes, you may need a laptop for assignments, in-class assignments, or something like that. Um, but probably the vast majority of college classes are lecture-based, um, where you probably don't need a laptop to do class assignments. Um, but MSU assumes that bringing a laptop to class um, is going to provide more benefits than it will impede learning. So is that actually true? OK. So portable technology. Uh, people are more and more bringing technology to class. So 95% of students bring their cell phone to class every day, and 29% bring a laptop. So. From the audience here, how many, raise your hand if you have your cell phone with you. OK. And that's mostly everyone. And how many people have brought a laptop? OK. So I think these um, percentages are still um, 
real today. Um, I think this was a study done in 2014. Okay, 62% of students report the use of electronic media for non-academic purposes, so something other than class assignments during class. So they're doing this during class, studying or doing homework. Uh, and then finally, portable devices though, um, give students opportunity to do a whole bunch of maybe off-task behaviors such as accessing Facebook, texting, instant messaging, shopping, reading news, watching sports, checking email, and playing video games like Flappy Bird. Um, so although there's people can, have been able to be distracted during class time throughout history, but I guess I would argue that the computer offers a variety of ways that people could get off task more than ever before. You, might, you know, some people might look out the window or talk to their friend, pass notes, um, or, you know, doodle. But the variety of distractions is higher today, I think, than at any time in the past. Um, so one thing that may occur is that because people are so used to using their devices, um, that they may become proficient at using multiple forms of media. So the research has looked at multimedia use um, and things like learning or memory. The evidence is pretty mixed about how heavy multimedia users um, perform cognitive functions. Some studies find heavy multimedia users are less able to filter out irrelevant information. So the idea is that um, because heavy multimedia users are so used to attending to so many different things, it's very hard for them to filter uh, distractions, things that they may not want to pay attention to. However, some studies find the opposite, that actually multi heavy multimedia users are better at some cognitive functions, like switching quickly between tasks. And then some studies find no difference. So it's kind of confusing. Does using multiple devices in class or otherwise lead to better cognitive performance or lower? It's unclear. But so we read this literature and thought that maybe why the studies show different results is because people vary in how well they can multi, like multitask. So perhaps intelligence moderates this relationship. Maybe some people are smart enough actually to look at their phones during class and pay attention both to the lecture um, and to what's going on um, on the internet or in their email. So this was another of these uh, Reddit comments. Um, so someone said, I don't know how I would have made it through most of my courses if I didn't have my computer in front of me. I don't learn applicable skills by listening to somebody talking about those skills, and a lot of classes are taught so slowly that I get bored if I'm not doing something else, doing something else on my computer, usually related to one of my classes, and half listening worked really well, and I got A's in most of these classes. So certainly instructors do a lot of repetition, right? Um, and so maybe peop smarter students know when they can tune out. Maybe they got it the first time that something was said. Um, and so, uh, it may be that those with higher intelligence, maybe they have a higher working memory capacity, um, maybe they're better able to filter out distraction. They know when they can multitask. They know when uh, they've got the information and when they don't and when they need to pay attention. Or they might just have more attentional resources. Maybe they can pay attention to more than one thing at a time. So we wanted to test out this hypothesis um, that perhaps you know, the, um, using ACT scores as a proxy for intelligence, maybe with those with 
higher ACT scores won't have any detriment for using their phone or using a laptop for off-task purposes in class. Maybe that won't affect their performance. Maybe those with lower ACT scores um, will have a problem being distracted by their phone. Maybe it'll affect their exam scores. So just as a general context, um, all the studies that I'm going to be talking to you about were done at Michigan State University in Psychology 101, which is the introductory psychology course at MSU. Um, it's a lecture-based course, so no one needs to bring their laptop to class um, or their phone to class. Um, there's no in-class activities. It's lecture-based. Um, there's mostly freshmen, sophomores, because it's an introductory psychology class. And it's a huge class. So intro to, intro to psychology at MSU has sections over 500 students. They're in huge auditoriums. And there are three sections per semester. So 1,500 students um, every semester take Psych 101. And so you can imagine with such a huge lecture that people could do a, a variety of things because they're somewhat anonymous. Uh, certainly the instructor is not going to be able to monitor what everyone's doing um, in course, in the course. Okay, so in our first study, uh, we uh, had 170 students participate uh, from Psych 101. And again, mostly they were freshmen and sophomores. And this was a self-report study, so we had people rate how much they were using uh, their devices for off-task purposes. So they rated the frequency and the duration of checking email, accessing Facebook, using the internet for non-class purposes, and texting, um, using a five-point scale. So from never to almost all of class, um, from zero minutes to greater than 30 minutes. They were also asked the degree to which they perceived that their portable device use affected their learning. So how did they believe their off-task use uh, affected their ability to pay attention in class? And we asked them these questions three times uh, per semester, one week before each test. And they responded to these survey questions using eye clickers. Do you guys know what eye clickers are? Yeah, OK. So it was pretty easy for them to respond. And they were, of course, told that uh, we weren't going to look at the data until after the grades were in, so that they weren't worried that you know, if they admitted to looking at Facebook during class, their grade wasn't going to um, suffer from that. And again, um, to assess our hypothesis about intellectual ability, um, we asked students to sign a waiver so that we could get their ACT scores. And there's research showing that intellectual ability um, is highly correlated with ACT scores. So the Psych 101 class um, is an hour and 50 minutes, and there's a 10-minute break within that time, and the class meets twice a week. So people reported using Facebook during class time one to three times for one to five minutes, email about the same, using the internet for browsing for non-class things one to three times for a little, a little bit longer, six to 15 minutes, and texting more frequently for about one to five minutes. So you can see students self-report a lot of different activities going on that are not related to the class during class time. OK, so I'm going to show you here is a scatter plot of uh, exam performance based on how much people used the internet. So um, Facebook, texting, email, and using the internet all were negatively correlated. But the only one that was reliable was internet use. So this is a figure looking at internet use during class. So the y-axis here is final exam score. You can see it goes from 50% to 100%. Um, and internet use is on the x-axis. So you can see that test performance is lower 
the more people reported to, for, to using the internet for non-class purposes during class time. And the correlation there is about negative 0.22, um, which is kind of a small but reliable effect. So if you looked at all the factors that were affecting exam score, about 5% was due to browsing the internet during class. So we also did um, a more formal model to look at how intelligence was affecting that relationship between internet use and exam score. Um, so what we did was we estimated internet use um, by looking at those surveys at time one, time two, and time three. And you can see how those contribute to internet use there. Um, the numbers indicate um, how much they were correlated to that factor of internet use. We also looked at classroom performance with the four exams, and then looked to see if those ACT scores were moderating the relationship between internet use and classroom performance. And so uh, what you can see is that, first of all, ACT scores was highly related to classroom performance. So our measure of intelligence was related to how well people did on the exams with a 0.42 correlation. Uh, it, ACT scores were not at all related to how much people use the internet during class. But the relationship between internet use and classroom performance remained negatively correlated. So even when we account for intelligence, the more students use the internet in class for non-class purposes, the lower their exam scores tend to be. OK. So then we also had data about how much people thought their internet use or their um, portable device use affected their learning. And we asked them again at three times, at exam one, exam two, and exam three. And the dark gray bars are the students with higher ACT scores. So we did it just a split between students at the higher end of the ACT scores and the lower end. And um, you can see that, you know, actually ACT score made no difference. At first, people rated um, that their, their portable device use hindered their learning. But by exam two, then they said it didn't make any difference. So, and that continued through the rest of the class. So students, for the most part, thought their internet use did not affect learning of class material. OK. We also looked at how internet use changed over the semester. And for students with lower ACT scores, their internet use stayed about the same. But the higher ACT score group tended to use the internet more over time. So again, it seemed like for exam one, internet use was lower, but after that exam, internet use increased for the higher ACT score group. So for experiment one, the, what we found from this study was that internet use related to test scores regardless of intellectual ability. The more students use the internet for non-class purposes, the lower their test scores. And in fact, those with the higher intellectual ability may be most at risk because their internet use tended to increase over time, over the semester. It could be that they do well on exam one, and they're like, oh, OK, so I can multitask in class, and it won't hurt me. They think they can handle it. Um, students do not believe, though, that their internet use affects their learning. So this begs the question, why? Um, I mean, it seems kind of common sense that, yeah, if you're not paying attention to lecture, you are going to learn less well. But students kind of deny this relationship. 
So for in the next study, we're trying to figure out why. Why do students think that the internet, their off-class portable device use, doesn't affect their learning? Well, maybe they're right. Maybe there's a third factor that's causing both internet use and low exam scores. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, <laughs> anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point, this is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. OK. So as instructors, I'm sure we've all seen those faces before. Uh, does anyone know what this movie this is from? Ferris Bueller, that's good. Right, so the question is maybe people, maybe students are using their laptop so much because they're just bored. And if you had an instructor like uh, this guy, you know, who can blame you, right? So again, one of these Reddit comments. Point is, it's not the distractions. It's the lack of motivation which causes distractions, and the lack of motivation that causes bad grades, which makes the two associated with each other. So this person is tapped into the idea that there's no direct relationship between internet use and lower exam scores, that people are bored in class, and so they use the internet to relieve their boredom, and so, and that is actually, the boredom is really tied to lower exam scores or a lack of motivation rather than internet use. So low motivation or interest in the class might underlie both internet use and lower exam scores. And previous research has shown 48% say they text in class because they are bored. Okay. If that's the case, that p students who are bored are using their laptop more or their phone more, um, they're rightly attributing their poor performance to an underlying cause, for example, boredom, rather than to their internet use. So in the next experiment, we're going to look at these factors, like interest in the class and motivation to do well, and how those relate to both um, portable device use and exam scores. But another reason for the disconnect between students' beliefs about technology and performance may be due to experimental demand. So students probably know what we're looking for, that um, we think that the more they are goofing off on the internet, the worse they're going to do on the exam. And so maybe they start like self-attributing their poor performance to their internet use. So it would be something like, I'm doing terrible in the class, so I must be using my devices too much. So they're self-reporting, and maybe they're just um, you know, basing their device use on how well they're doing in the class. So in the next study, we also want to use more objective measures um, so that we get an accurate picture of how much and what people are doing during class. And this is a more reliable way. So in this experiment, again in Psych 101, 84 students logged into a proxy server uh, more than half of the class session. So what the, in the psych department, we set up a, a server that students had to log in when they entered class. Um, so out of the 500 students, 84 students agreed to do this. Again, we told them that 
all the data we collect will not be looked at until after the course grades are in. We also asked them about their motivation and interest in class on a five-point scale. And again, we asked for ACT scores so that we could use those as an index of intellectual ability. Um, so keep in mind, here we are only tracking internet use, which was the only reliable um, measure that we found in the previous study. Um, any kind of internet activity we're able to track. But if people use their laptop and open Word, we won't be able to, to track that kind of activity. And um, this proxy server would log the a, a number of HTTP requests and what URL um, people visited, so we knew where they went on the internet. And then we classified this use as either social media, email, shopping, news, sports, videos, or online games. And then we also looked at any use that might be class-related on the internet. So the class was hosted on Desire to Learn, which is D2L here. Um, and we also, I went through a whole bunch of Wikipedia searches, some of which were related to the class, um, such as classical conditioning. Someone looked that up on the day classical conditioning was talked about. Others were completely unrelated. Someone was very excited that the Gilmore Girls were going to come out with a new special. And there was some Wikipedia searches about Stars Hollow. So those would be classed, uh, classified as off-task. And the classical conditioning and other kinds of um, related to the class topics were classified as class-related, using the word class a lot. Again, class was about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so these are our objective measures of class-related use. Um, on average, per session, people spent about four minutes on class-related use, ranging from one to 11 minutes with four HTTP re requests. Off-task use was over a third of the class time, uh, with a range of 17 minutes up to a whole hour and with 539 HTTP requests. So someone didn't click 539 times. These requests are for any information that's downloaded. So if you're looking at Facebook and a video ad is playing on the side, you didn't request that, but it may ping the internet to get that video. So this is more of a measure of how much your screen changed, really. The top category of use in class was social media. So we constructed an overall score of internet use in class by multiplying the frequency of requests by their duration. And so again, this is a scatter plot. Um, the results were remarkably consistent with experiment one. Um, there was a negative correlation between a uh, final exam score and um, internet use around negative 0.25. So again, a reliable effect, but about 5% of the variance explained. Um, what about, so our big question of interest though was whether this can be explained by motivation and interest in the class. So all those variables were related to exam score. If you're more motivated to do well, you'll do better on the tests. If you're more interested in the class, you'll do better on the tests. If you have higher intellectual ability, you'll, be, you'll do better on the tests. So not very surprising. Um, the only variable that was somewhat related to internet use was interest. So the more people were interested in class, the less they did off-task internet use. Um, so what we wanted to see is whether, if we take out all these factors, is there still a relationship between portable device use and, and learning? So if we look at the variance explained by intelligence, motivation, and interest, that accounts for about 21% of the variance in exam score. Internet use still accounted for an additional 6% of the variance. So even, 
if you account for people's interest in the class, their motivation to do well, their intellectual ability, still there is this relationship. The more that the internet um, is browsed for non-class purposes during class, the lower exam scores. And again, students with higher ACT scores show the same negative correlation between internet use and exam score. So this is true regardless of intellectual ability, regardless of how interested you are in the class, regardless of how motivated you are to get a good grade. We looked at class-related use, are those D2L and Wikipedia searches, and they were not related to exam score. So the correlation was about 0.09. Um, but so it wasn't, it wasn't negatively or positively predictive of exam performance. So from the results of this experiment, we know that it's not a third variable, like interest in the course or motivation to do well. It doesn't explain the relationship between technology use and exam score. Class-related use showed no benefit to exam score. So maybe we should ban laptops. Maybe people should, I mean, I think it'd be hard to ban self smartphones, but maybe we should ask students not to bring laptops to class. But I think before we decide that, we need a much better estimate of class-related use, because so far, all we looked at was anything related to the internet, like looking at the class website and doing Wikipedia searches. But people use their laptops for more than that during class. They take notes on it. They may view class slides. So I think we need a better measure of class-related use before we decide what, what policies to make about banning laptops. So that's the purpose of the final experiment that I will talk to you about. Um, what we found, you know, the relationship between off-task use and exam performance seems pretty clear. Um, in both studies and in other studies done by other groups, there's this clear relationship, negative correlation between how much uh, off-task activities occur in class learning and that this occurs regardless of intelligence. But is there any benefit from bringing a laptop to class? So to answer this question, we are going to um, track all laptop activity, not just internet browsing. So why might um, laptop, a laptop benefit learning? One is note taking. You know you can type a lot faster than you can write, so maybe typing notes um, would be beneficial. That might not be the case. So there was this um, study that got a lot of press several years ago about looking at performance using written notes versus typed notes on a laptop. So subjects in that study looked at a TED Talk, and then they were tested on this TED Talk. And in this graph, what you can see um, for factual questions, they're comparing uh, longhand notes versus laptop notes. There's really no difference in uh, success in answering factual questions. But if you look at the right side, these are more conceptual learning questions. Those who were handwriting notes did much better answering those questions than those typing notes on a laptop. And the reason they thought this occurred was because people typing on a laptop, just because you can go so fast, you just type exactly what the instructor says. You're not thinking about it. You're just typing exact verbatim what you hear. Um, and so they looked at how many of the notes were exact copies of what the instructor said. And what they found was that people typing on a laptop had more verbatim notes than people writing longhand. Okay, so um, this research would suggest that typing notes, bringing a laptop to type notes, is not going to be beneficial. But keep in mind, this was not a real classroom. It was people in a lab watching a TED Talk. So um, I think a, a better test might be looking at people who are taking notes during an actual class. Another reason why um, a laptop might help 
is to have a copy of the slides as the instructor is going on. So again, we're really just looking at lecture-based courses here. Oftentimes people have PowerPoint slides that they project onto a screen like what I'm doing here. Um, and maybe if you're sitting really far back um, or someone with a big hat is sitting in front of you, your view is obstructed. And so maybe having a copy that gets really close to you can help you follow along with the lecture. Um, so we also looked at some other reasons, uh, looking at the syllabus, calculating your grade. These are all things students do during class. Um, that might not benefit learning because um, what you're, or doing relevant Wikipedia searches. We didn't really find any relationship between those variables in our previous study. And that may be because if you're paying attention to one subject, like you're learning more about classical conditioning, you're probably missing other things. So net, net, it's a washout. It doesn't help you, it doesn't hurt you. You learn more in depth about one subject at the decrement of another subject. Okay, so in this experiment, we are actually gonna use this software called Rescue Time that tracks the active window um, on students' laptops. So 103 students agreed to participate in this study and the um, Rescue Time software um, tracks the document name or the URL of what is in the active screen. So again, not, you know, methods aren't perfect. In this case, we're not being able to track something that might be happening in the background. So people, for example, might have the slides up, but in the background, they've got their reading an email. We would not be able to track that use. What we will be able to track is not just internet activity, but other application use like Excel and PowerPoint and Word. So this is a few examples of what people actually were doing in class. So someone looked up Aristotelian physics on September 18th on Wikipedia. Science in the Catholic Church. There's a lot of interesting searches going on in class. Zhu Guanqi, who was a Chinese philosopher. Someone watched a somewhat related psychology video on the Milgram uh, obedience study. Um, and someone took notes on September 20th using Word. So you can see here we've got the document name. And we did ask students if they were taking notes to title it something that we would know this was related to, to psychology. Okay, so um, again, hour and 15 minute class. Off task use was about 28 minutes, so a little less than a third, with a standard deviation of 22 minutes for off task purposes. Class related use was about 34 minutes. So now we're getting a lot more uh, ability to look at class related activities. So let's just look at off-task use first and how it's related to exam score. Um, so again, y-axis is the exam average score. Um, and then the x-axis here is duration. Um, and this is a composite of all off-task use, like Facebook, social media, what have you. And again, very consistent rela negative relationship of about 0.23. Once you remove intellectual ability, that's about 5% of the variance in exam score is explained by off-task laptop, laptop activities. Um, also of interest, I think, is um, lots of students were doing homework for other classes, which we uh, classified as off-task activities because even though it's academic, it's for a different class. But I was kind of surprised at how many people are doing homework for a different class during the, the class time. And I've talked to some students about it, and I think they feel like they're being productive that way. Right? They're not goofing off. They're doing homework. But it still has the same kind of relationship. If you're paying attention to a different subject, you're not paying attention to the lecture. Okay, so out of our classroom related activities, we did find a positive correlation with slide viewing. So the more people viewed slides during class 
on their laptop, the higher their exam score. It's about, again, a, a low but reliable um, correlation. 6% of the variance in exam score was due to looking the duration of looking at slides on a laptop. So our explanation first was, well, maybe, again, it's a visual problem. They can't see the screen. So we had students mark on a seating diagram of the classroom where they sat in a typical class. Um, so they would mark on this map. Uh, but we did not find any relationship. So the further back you sat didn't mean you looked at the slides longer on your laptop. So it doesn't seem like it's a vision problem. So why does slide viewing help? Um, our current hypothesis is that it's, again, leading to less verbatim note taking. So if it's like psychologically satisfying, right, if you have the slides on your laptop, you know you can refer to them at any time. If it's projected on a screen, you might be so busy scrambling to write what's on the projector that, again, you're not really integrating what you hear. So at least in this study, we're finding that viewing slides on a laptop was related to higher exam scores. Um, as another study looked at um, a condition where they handed out the slides but on paper, and they found that same positive correlation, that um, they were actually looking at how many verbatim notes people took if they had paper handouts of the slides, and they took less if they had those slides. And we found this interesting relationship between uh, the type of note-taking style people used and viewing slides. So that positive correlation was only found for students who were handwriting their notes. So our idea is that taking verbatim notes is bad. It's not letting you think about the material. So if you're doing handwritten notes, plus you have slides on your laptop, maybe that's the conditions that result in the fewest verbatim notes. But we have not tested this um, so far. Um, so this is speculation at this point. And so another question would be, OK, well, I've come to class. I've brought my laptop. And my full intention is to take notes or view slides. But maybe I get tempted because I'm hooked up to the internet. You know, I really like to play solitaire. So I would be very tempted to play solitaire all the time as I'm writing papers. In fact, I have a little thing where if I do write a page, I can play another round of solitaire. So it is, you know, if it's the fact that hey, I, you know, maybe there's some benefit to laptops, but now if I bring it and now I get distracted more, well, again, it kind of washes out. Maybe there's not a benefit to laptops that's worth it. So what we did um, is looked at the correlation between class-related use and off-task use. And off-task use or class use did not provoke or evoke more off-task use. In fact, they were negative-related. The more you used your device for class-related purposes, the less you used it for off-task purposes. And it was um, a correlation that was pretty, uh, well, it wasn't small. It was medium-sized of about 0.44. So more class-related use predicted less off-task use. So it's not the case if you bring your laptop, you're going to you know, necessarily be tempted to do off-task activities. OK, so through all those three studies, we replicated the relationship between off-task portable device use and exam scores. We had some evidence that maybe bringing a laptop to class might be beneficial if you're looking at slides. But you know, maybe a paper, maybe you don't need to bring your laptop. Maybe you could just have a paper copy of the slides. But then, I don't know, is that really environmentally good? Um, you know, do we really want people to print out the slides for every class? Probably not. So maybe slide viewing on a laptop might be the best thing to do. Class-related activities did not lead to more off-task behaviors. So 
kind of my plan going forward is to find ways to focus on interventions that reduce that off-task class use. Um, is there a way that we can help students not give into temptation and look at their phones or laptops to do other things, even if it's homework for other classes? But there's a number of solutions that have been proposed, again, by the Reddit um, people. One is maybe we should have non-tech friendly classrooms. So this person says, I would enclose every classroom with a Faraday cage. As an architect, I have already suggested it to all the new schools we are building. So there, you can't get any signals in, so p students wouldn't be able to get onto the internet. We could blame the teacher. This person said, what I would do is try to find better lecturers or restructure lectures in a way that are more engaging for students. The students are paying hand over fist for the degree. At least they could be offered engaging education and not be there at 10 and look like you're participating. So they were placing all the burden on the instructors. And so some student, this teacher decided to dress up like Darth Vader to engage his students more. Um, you know, certainly there's a range of instructors. Um, I don't know, I think students can be bored even with really enthusiastic teachers. So I'm not sure that's gonna be a good fit for everyone in terms of solutions. We could ban cell phones and laptops. This teacher said, I had a zero tolerance policy for non-disabled students with any screens or be beeping, even in, a large even in large classes, a single ring or a look at a phone, and they were out of class. I kicked out 20 students out once. Some students hated me. Most of them appreciated it. So then again, the, the burdens on the instructor to kind of police these things. You can see everyone had to put their phone up by the chalkboard. Is that realistic? Probably not. And plus, the phones are used as the emergency system as in many schools. What happens if someone steals a cell phone? I just begging for trouble there. Um, so I don't think this is going to be a long-term solution. Plus, kicking out students, you know, then you're really making <laughs> the relationship between laptop and use and lower exam scores really high. Um, education, so maybe we can just tell students about this relationship, like what I'm doing now. I don't think that's going to work either. First of all, students don't admit they have a problem. Second, students rate that these warnings are just common sense. They're not, of course, yes, of course everyone knows that using a laptop in class is going to, if you're doing off-task stuff, you're going to do lower on the exam. But people don't think it means anything to them. Yes, that's true for most people, but not me. So I don't think just warning students is going to be the answer either. So. What I'm thinking is that we need to have like a personalized feedback system to show students actually how much time they are spending on off-class, off-task activities. So if you have screen time on your phone, for example, you can use it to tell you what you're doing. Rescue time also has reports so you can see how much time you spent on Facebook and Pinterest and and things like that. So there you've got a personalized um, report that shows you actually how much time you're using. You might be surprised. I was very surprised at how much time I was devoting to solitaire. Um, students underestimate time spent on activities. That's um, known. And even trying to get back onto on task if the student got a notification, it took them about eight or nine minutes to get back to the class, even though they intended to get back as quickly as possible. So that's one possibility. Give students personalized feedback. Another thing I've been thinking about is framing the feedback. So I'll ask you guys to rate yourself. How well do you do two things at once? And just remember your answer. Are you terrible? Are you, do you do slightly well at that? Sometimes well, mostly well, or excellent? So just think about, you know, how well do you do two things at once? 
And then the next question is, how well can you switch quickly between tasks? Same scale, terrible, slightly well, sometimes well, mostly well, excellent, okay? So how many people um, had a higher score for doing two things at once than switching between tasks? How many people had a higher score for switching between tasks? So you thought you could switch tasks faster, like you did that better than doing two things at once. Yeah. OK, well, that's against my hypothesis. Thank you all. No. <laughs> Previous research has shown that if you ask people to estimate how much is it going to cost you um, if to do two things at once versus how much is it going to cost you to switch between tasks, people are way more accurate at the switching tasks estimate than the, the doing two tasks at once estimate. Um, so my idea, which maybe your guys' feedback is now making me second guess this, um, if we framed those personalized reports as um, you switched between lecture and face Facebook five times versus you attended to both lecture and Facebook five times. It might make a difference. Maybe people will realize, oh, I'm switching tasks. That's bad. Versus, oh, I did two things at once. That's not so bad, because I'm better at that. Anyway, that was one idea. There's a lot of outstanding issues in this research. Um, for example, this is all lecture-based. Um, what about flipped classrooms, where people do assignments during class, and then they watch lectures at home? There's no research showing, like, what are people actually doing with their technology during that? They're supposed to be doing class assignments. Are they doing class assignments? We don't know. Also, all, our, all the research, except for like one study, is on social science classes. But um, you know, STEM is quite different in that there's a lot more pictures. And in fact, students write their notes a lot more in STEM classes because you can't type out like chemical interactions. So maybe this doesn't hold up for STEM learning. Maybe technology is used in a different way. I actually sat in on an or organic chemistry class recently, and I noticed a lot of students taking pictures with their phone of the board. Maybe that helps. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe people should bring their smartphones to class. Um, so all these are interesting avenues. OK. So now for some good news. So you guys probably all think I'm such a curmudgeon. I hate technology. It's bad for you. But I'm really not, because I've been playing computer games for 30 years now. I started out with Zork, which is this text-based game, in 1986. So I want technology to be good. I want to be able to bring my technology to class. So you know that maybe I'm trying to find um, some positive messages for technology. But the media is really, um, the headlines aren't so good for technology these days. So in this cartoon, you know, there's this um, idea that our technology is making us dumb, um, that our memories are becoming smaller, and um, we're not able to function cognitively as well anymore. These are some recent headlines. Smartphones are making us stupid and maybe a gateway drug. The unexpected way that new technology makes us unhappy, so it's depressing, too. The app that broke the Iowa caucus, like it's affecting our elections. And as coronavirus spreads, so does fake news. So I'm really going to talk about one experience that um, is related to fake news. Um, I recently got caught on a fake news story about Harvey Weinstein getting the Presidential Medal of Honor in this photo, even though the photo looks obviously faked, I still, for a minute, thought, oh, this is true. It was actually Joe Biden who got the medal. Anyway, the problem with this is, for an instant, I thought this was true. Did I form a false memory? So now when I go back and think about what Obama did during his presidency, am I going to falsely remember this event? So that's the question. Um, how do people get their news? Well, older people tend to get their news from the TV. But younger people, um, like you, 
now get most of their news online. And the problem with that is that there's less fact checking um, for online, you know, if you look at news on Facebook, anyone can post anything, fake pictures like what I just showed you. Um, and so possibly um, this is making people vulnerable to false memory formation and inaccurate information. So maybe this inaccurate information can lead to false memories and this might be particularly true for social media. Go social media has a gossipy kind of tone. It might be it leads to better memory for news on social media, according to one study. On the other hand, you know, people know that you can post anything on social media. Maybe we're all savvy to this. When people uh, evaluate information, they often take in the source and the credibility of the source. So we wanted to see how vulnerable people were to false memory formation on information provided by social media versus a neutral context. So this was an experiment where we had 107 students. They watched a series of picture that, pictures that depicted a theft happening. So it was a series of pictures where someone breaks into a car, they search the glove compartment, the person's wearing a baseball hat, and then they look in the trunk and there's drugs in there, and it's a very exciting set of pictures. Um, and then after that, um, they look at these feeds that were either designed to look like Twitter, Twitter actually looked like that back in 2014, um, or this neutral photo recap. So they were told that um, students who had partic participated in this experiment before wrote these feeds. Um, out of the 36 pieces of information, six of them were false. Okay, so then later after viewing these feeds, they did some other tasks for a little bit and then they had to take a test about the information and how accurate they thought it was. So, in the two, tw we have two Twitter conditions because we, um, you know, usually again, Twitter is very gossipy. It's not full sentences. That would be kind of weird. But the neutral context, we used full sentences. So there might be some weird language thing going on. So we had another Twitter condition where people used full sentences. In the end, it didn't matter. Both Twitter conditions were exactly the same. So um, we combined the Twitter conditions and the neutral condition, the control condition. So the black bars here are the Twitter group. The control, the gray bars are the control neutral feed. Um, there's, again, no difference between the Twitter group, so we combined those. And students were asked to rate how confident they were that the information on the test was correct. So we looked first at correct information. So information that was in the images of the picture of the story and the feed, you saw the information twice, so people were more confident that information was correct and there was no difference between Twitter and control. Same thing for information that was only in the, in the story. No difference. Oh, I think I missed a point. Okay, anyway. Now we're gonna look at information that wasn't true so either things that, information that was not true that was not in the Twitter feed and false information. So the, on the suggested items on the left here, you can see that the Twitter group was less confident that information was correct than the control group. So they realized, more likely to realize that was false information but they were both equivalent for the novel item. So it was really that people seeing information on Twitter um, were more savvy that that information could be incorrect. We also looked at things like working memory capacity and how much attention they said they were paying to the feeds, and there was no difference there. So people looking or finding hearing about information on t Twitter, we're actually less likely to be misled by it. And even though, even though both sources in the neutral context and the Twitter context were supposed to be the same people, past participants. 
So th the good news is that people factor in the credibility of the communication medium as well as the person. They look at not just who is saying it, but how. How are they getting the information? So they're aware that social media can contain inaccuracies. OK, so to wrap this all up together, should students bring a laptop to class? Maybe. There might be some benefit for viewing slides. Uh, certainly, class-related use does not lead to more off-task use. Um, but I do think we need to create some interventions to increase the awareness of off-task classroom activities. How vulnerable are people to fake news on social media? Less vulnerable than if they see it somewhere else. So they're factoring the credibility of the source. They realize that some sources of information are less credible than others. OK, so I would just like to thank my collaborators, uh, especially the students in Psych 101 who participated in this. And I have my lab website here um, for those interested in hearing more. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. One.